was his undergraduate and PhD. Uh, he, he, was, he finished his PhD in 1991 and then moved to Cornell, and where I presume you were doing your postdoc, uh, also partly in Santa Fe uh, following that. And then uh, in 2002, he moved to University of Michigan where he's a distinguished professor. He's also an affiliate professor at uh, the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, Mark has numerous awards. Uh, one of them I know is the Lagrange Prize. Uh, the other is uh, from University of Michigan, there's a prize in uh, education. Uh, so he's a distinguished uh, educator there. Uh, Guggenheim Fellow and uh, Simons Fellow. So he's quite decorated. He works on uh, something that uh, he's gonna discuss, uh, namely networks, complex networks in variety of application from social, social networks to citations, scientific citations and uh, epidemics, et cetera. So he's gonna tell us about it today. Thank you. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that nice introduction, Leo. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, been a while. I was last here about 15 years ago, so it's nice to be back. Um, I'm going to talk about networks today. Um, not an obvious talk, or not, not an obvious subject for a physicist to be talking about, um, but I hope to convince you that physics has some interesting things to say about this. Um, since this is a bit out of the mainstream of physics, I'm not going to assume uh, that uh, you're experts in this area. So let's start at the beginning with what is a network. And for the purpose of this talk, a network just means a bunch of dots joined together by lines in some way. In the jargon of the field, a dot is called a node or a vertex. A line is called an edge. And I will use that jargon throughout this talk, nodes and edges. We're interested in these, as, these networks as a, uh, a tool, as a compact mathematical representation of the structure of all sorts of complex systems that we care about in science and human society. Let me give you some examples. This is a picture of the internet. Um, the internet is a network where the nodes are computers and the edges are data connections between computers of some kind. Um, you can't actually see the nodes on this picture. They're too small. There are a lot of them. Uh, a lot of the questions in this field revolve around the connection between structure and function in these networks. If you look at this network, it's clear there is a lot of structure here. There's stuff going on. Um, and uh, you can ask how that structure affects the function of the system. So the internet is designed to do a job getting data from point A to point B. How well does it do that job? How does it do that job as a function of the structure of the system? Uh, yes? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. So what, is, what do you mean by connection here? Like, if once we have the internet and everybody's online, how can you not be connected? Like so, so a connection here actually means a cable running through the ground, oh, like right. an, an optical fiber cable. So it's, are these two devices actually physically connected by uh, a cable? Yeah. So just also to clarify, on the previous slide, um, is the location of the, of the nodes meaningful, and is the strength of the edge meaningful? Good, good questions. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Here's another picture of a network. This is a transportation network. The nodes are airports, and the edges are flights. The locations are very important in this case. But there are other cases where the locations are not important at all. In fact, there are cases where they don't even have locations. Strengths of edges, also same thing. There are some cases where it is important. You might care about the volume of traffic along each flight here. It affects you if you're an, airport, air, an, an airline. You have to decide how big an air, airplane to fly on that route. Um, but other cases where it's not. So excellent questions. Um, so here's a case where it's not important where the nodes are. If I have a web page like this one, there's various things I can click on, links. And if I click on a link, it takes me to another web page. So there was a connection between the first web page and the second web page. I can make a network out of that in which the nodes are web pages and the edges are hyperlinks between web pages. You click on this web page, it takes you to this other one. That's an example where the web pages don't really have a location. You can't say that this Wikipedia page is somewhere in the world. So location doesn't matter in that case. This is a picture of a very small portion of the web. The web itself has billions of nodes. You couldn't make a picture of the whole thing. It's probably the biggest network that we have studied 
You can think of this as an information network. It's like there's information stored on the nodes of the network, and then the links are telling you something about the structure of that information, about how different pieces of information are linked together. Here's another example of an information network. This is a citation network. Leo mentioned citation networks. This is a network where the nodes are papers, and the edges are which paper cites which other paper in its bibliography. So this is scientific papers. In this particular case, they're actually net papers about networks. <coughs> Notice also that in this particular case, the edges are directed. There's arrows on them. That's because the, the relationship goes in a particular way. This paper cites this other paper, so they have a direction to them. That's allowed. You can have that. Okay. Uh, another big and important class of networks is biological networks. Um, biologists are very excited about network science in recent years. Here's one example. This is a metabolic network. It's a, a network representation of the chemical machinery of the cell. The nodes are metabolites, i.e. chemicals in the cell, and the edges are metabolic reactions that turn one metabolite into another one. Um, there's been a lot of advances in the last couple of decades in so-called high-throughput methods for measuring metabolic pathways. There's a lot of excitement about combining the data on networks that we get from that with network theory ideas in the hope of gaining some new understanding of this tremendously complicated cellular machinery. Uh, I think it's the number of times that within the paper that this oh, other paper was cited. If I cite it several times, it probably means more to me than if I only cited it once in the introduction. Um, here's another biological example. This is at the organismal scale, i.e. whole organisms. This is what's called a food web. It's an ecological network. In the common parlance, we talk about the food chain. You know, this species eats this other species, eats this other species. But it's not a chain, right? It's actually a tremendously complicated network. The nodes in this network are species, and the edges are which species each with which other species. Uh, so as you can see, you know, it's this ferociously complicated pattern of interactions. This is, this is a real ecosystem, incidentally, that you're looking at. This is a freshwater ecosystem from a lake in Wisconsin called Little Rock Lake. So it's an actual place, and some eco e ecologists went there, and they found all the species that live in the lake, and they constructed this network of which, ones eat which other ones. Yeah, well, there's, yeah, so there's this interesting feature up there. That, that little <laughs> earring, that's, in graph theory, we call that a self-edge. That's allowed. You can have an edge that connects a note to itself. In this particular context, that means cannibalism, right? That's a species which eats itself. Um, and then there's social networks, another big and important class of networks, and one that consumes me for a lot of the research that I do. Uh, if you say the word social networks to people these days, I think most people think of online social networks, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. But to scientists working in this area, social networks have a much broader definition. A social network just means any network where the nodes are people and the edges are some kind of social connection between people. So that could be online social networks, but it can be lots of offline things as well. In fact, arguably, the sociologists have the longest history of quantitative study of networks, going back at least to this guy here, Jacob Moreno, he was a psychologist living and working in New York City in the 1920s and 30s. And as part of his work, he came up with these little hand-drawn diagrams which show patterns of interaction between groups of people. This particular one here, which is taken from his book, uh, shows patterns of play amongst children in a schoolyard. Uh, sociologists have been doing this ever since. Here's a sort of modern day equivalent. This is a friendship network from a US high school. The nodes are kids in the school, and the edges are which ones are friends with which other ones. One of the reasons why there's been a lot of interest in social networks recently, huge amounts of NIH funding being poured into this, is because of the role that they play in the spread of disease. Diseases spread when people have close contact with one another. Um, this particular network here is an example of that. This is from a study from my friend Aldous Krebs of uh, the spread of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is an airborne disease. It spreads when somebody coughs on somebody else. This is a network of who's been in close proximity with whom. And the disease is going to spread exactly over this network, meaning Nodes will infect each other along the edges of the network. So if you want to understand how the disease is going to spread, you need to know the structure of this network. Um, 
Let me give you one more example. This is from my own work. This is uh, a collaboration network. Uh, so this is a network of uh, collaborations between scientists in this case. So the nodes are scientists. The edges are who's written a paper with who else. I mentioned edish numbers in the title of the talk. Edish numbers are to do with how many steps are you through the network of collaborations from other scientists. And the famous result is that it's not very many to get anywhere. Talk about that more in a moment. This, in, this network here is interesting because, uh, because it's one of the best documented and largest offline social networks we have. Most offline social networks are very hard to measure. Right? If you want to know who's friends with whom, that's a difficult thing to get at. If you want to know who's been in close proximity with whom, that's a very difficult thing to get at. But this one is well documented. We have big databases, you know, PubMed and Web of Science and stuff like that of published papers. And it's a straightforward matter to get one of those databases and just turn it into a huge network. There's millions of scientists in the world. So this is, in principle, a very large and well documented offline social network. There are larger online ones, but this is probably the biggest offline one we have. All right, good. So that tells you a little bit about the kind of systems that people are interested with here. What I want to do with uh, this talk is two things. First of all, I want to first tell you about a couple of the classic results in this field that everyone should know about. In fact, you probably do know about some of them already because they're kind of famous. Um, and then in the last part of the talk, I, I'd like to tell you about what physics can contribute to this, and in particular about some work that we've been doing in my own group at the University of Michigan. So let's get into it. The first thing that I want to tell you about is perhaps the classic result in this field. It's the fa most famous result. It's sometimes called the small world effect. And it, it, uh, it comes out of this experiment that was done in the 1960s by this guy here, Stanley Milgram, experimental psychologist then at Harvard University. He was interested in the question of how far are, how far are you away from other people through the social network? Not geographically, but in the sense of I know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows the president or something like that. How many steps is it through the social network to get to other people? Not an easy question to answer because uh, you don't have a map of the whole social network. So what can you do? He came up with an experimental way of tackling this problem. He recruited a bunch of volunteers, the majority of them from the town of Omaha, Nebraska, and he got them to play a game. The game was the following. He gave them a letter, and they, get, they were asked to get this letter to an intended target person recipient who was a friend of his who lived in Boston. But you couldn't just send the, paper, the, the letter directly to the target person. You could only send it to somebody that you knew personally, like on a first name basis. So the game was, you think, who do I know on a first name basis who's closer to this target person in Boston? You send it to them, and then they repeat the exercise. They send it to someone they know, and so forth. And cooperatively, you try and get it to its intended recipient. So you'll not be surprised to hear that the first result of this experiment was that most of the letters got lost. Only <laughs> less than a third of them actually arrived. Um, <clears throat> but of the ones that did arrive, famous result, it took on average about six steps to get from randomly chosen volunteer in Omaha, Nebraska, to this target person in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, no, so, yeah, in the context of citation, exactly, this is the Edos number. The Edos number is like, how many steps is it through citation network from you to get to Paul Edos, the famous mathematician? Exactly, so this is the same thing. This is the Milgram's friend in Boston number. You know, how many steps is it through the social network to get to them? Um, uh, so this, this result has become pretty famous. It's passed into the folklore, sort of semi-mythological result. It's often referred to by the name The Six Degrees of Separation, which do actually doesn't come from Milgram's work. It comes from the title of this play by John Guare that came out many years later, in which Milgram's work is discussed, later made into a pretty good movie. Um, and it's also you know, the subject of parlor games where you try and connect movie actors together. It's the subject of satirical headlines in the Onion <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> So, so Milgram's experiment was, it was not a controlled experiment. Milgram had a rather cavalier disregard for experimental niceties. And I don't think you should take his six degrees of separation as gospel. Um, but this basic principle that it's only a small number of steps from you to anybody else 
is widely believed to be true. It may not, might not be six, it might be four, it might be eight, but the basic idea that it's only a small number of steps has been reproduced in so many different networks in so many different ways that we firmly believe this to be the case. In fact, it's not even that surprising when you think about it. The simple argument is, suppose everybody has 100 friends. Then the number of people one degree of separation away from me. That's just all of my friends. There are 100 of them. Each of them has 100 friends, so the number of friends of friends is 100 times 100, or 10,000. That's the number of people two degrees of separation away. Three steps away is 100 times 100 times 100, which is a million, and then it's 100 million, and then it's 10 billion. But 10 billion is more than the total number of people in the whole world. There's only 8 billion people in the world, so that's it. I went five steps, and I got everybody. Uh, well, so there are some holes in this argument. You may even have spotted some of them already. But, but again, we believe that the basic idea is true. That, that what's basically happening here is you, the number of people you can reach as you go out from any starting point is just growing exponentially. And that means it only takes a logarithmic number of steps to get to everybody in the world. Um, this result, it turns out, has some substantial practical implications. And here's one example. This figure shows number of cases over time of COVID-19 at the start of the current pandemic going back three years. If you cast your mind back to the beginning of 2020, back here, uh, all of the cases that we saw in this country, in the US, were cases that were brought in from outside. Somebody went abroad, caught the disease there, and came back with it. But starting in the beginning of February sometime, this dotted red line here, we transitioned to so-called community spread, which means that there was person-to-person -person transmission going on within the country. And, when, and you can see a very sharp change at that point. When that happens, you suddenly see the infection taking off here in the US. Notice that the scales here are semi-log, horizontal one time in days is linear, vertical one number of cases is logarithmic. So that approximately straight line growth you see there is exponential growth. It levels off at the top. That's because we had a lockdown and we started to flatten the curve. But until that point, it's pretty much a straight line. And why is that? It's because of this exponential growth of the number of people you can reach in your network. There's some initial carrier of the disease. They give it to some fraction of their friends. Those people give it to some fraction of their friends. And if the number of people you can reach is growing exponentially, then the number of cases of disease you'll see is growing exponentially as well. OK, so that's one example of, as I say, perhaps the most famous result in the field. Here's another famous result in this field, which turns out to be very important. Uh, due, arguably, to this guy here, Anatole Rappaport. He was a mathematician, actually, at my own institution at the University of Michigan in the 50s, 60s, 70s. He, did, he, he actually worked a lot of things. He's famous for his work on uh, game, game theory and the prisoner's dilemma. Um, but another thing he did was he did some important early empirical studies of social networks working with kids in the Ann Arbor School District. Ann Arbor is the town where the University of Michigan is located. And uh, one of the things, he, so he, he, he just asked these kids who their friends were, and he constructed the network of who's friends with whom. And one of the things that he noticed about this network is that most of the kids had just a few friends, but there were a few there that just had a huge number of friends. We call these hubs in the network. There are just a few nodes that have an awful lot of connections. Um, interestingly, he didn't actually draw a graph of the distribution, which is what I would expect anybody to do today. This paper was in 1961, and he just published a table with all the numbers in it, which I find a bit weird, but maybe that's what people did in 1961. Anyway, there's nothing to stop you taking the numbers and just making your own graph of them, and this is what it looks like. It looks like, so, so horizontal axis is number of friends, vertical axis is number of people that have that many friends. So you see a lot of people just have a few friends down here, but there's a few people out here in the tail that have a lot. It looks like, roughly speaking, a Poisson distribution, but it's not. Look, the modal value here is 4. If the modal value is 4, that means the standard deviation is 2, because square root of 4 is 2. That means this point out here, 30, is 15 standard deviations away from the mean. If this was just Poisson independent probabilities, then there would be no chance of this ever happening. This person out here is an extreme outlier with their 30 friends. And this, sorry? Um, these things vary, so sometimes they, they can be log normal. Often they follow a power law distribution. I'll show you some distributions in a moment. Uh, maybe I won't. I think maybe I took that slide out. But uh, yes, they can be uh, log normal. Um, 
so what this means is there is a small number of nodes that have very high degree. So the degree of a node in a network is the number of connections it has. So like how many friends do you have in a friendship network? We are looking at the degree distribution, and there's a small number of nodes that have very high degree. It turns out that these can play a huge role in the behavior of the system. We saw this, for instance, in this picture of the internet that I showed right at the beginning. You can see that there are hubs in this network. There are these star-like structures that have a lot of connections. Most nodes only have one or two connections, but there are a few that have a huge number. And it turns out that in a lot of practical situations, these nodes, these hubs, even though they're only small in number, are dominant in their effect on the behavior of the system, even though there's only a few of them. I'll give you one example of that, and it again uh, refers to the spread of disease. Here's that picture I showed earlier from Baldus Krebs' study of the spread of tuberculosis. Um, so looking at this network, you can see there are hubs. There are, there are nodes that have a lot of connections, and one could certainly imagine that this would have a big effect on the spread of disease. This person in the middle, for instance, has you know, 100 connections or something like that. If this person got sick with some infection, then they could potentially spread it to an awful lot of people. So that would be bad. right? But it's actually even worse than that, because this person in the middle is also more likely to get the disease in the first place, because there's 100 people they could catch it from. So there are 100 times more likely to catch the disease, and then there are 100 times more likely to pass it on. So there are 100 times 100, or 10,000 times more effective at spreading the disease than the person who only has one connection. So it turns out, in fact, it's not your degree, the number of connections you have, that matters, but your degree squared. And this means that these hubs, with their large numbers of connections, really have this huge effect on the behavior of the system. In fact, in many cases, they're all that you need to worry about. You can forget about everybody else. Only the hubs matter. But the, the individual that has 1,000 connections is a million times more effective at spreading the disease than the individual who has only one. So, one, so you mentioned these power law tails. Mm -hmm. So are there examples where the power tail is uh, bigger than, no, smaller than two? Uh, not usually, no. No, okay. no it's, so u it's u usually greater than two, yeah. So it has to have a finite first moment, oh, but it can have a diverging second moment if it's between two and three. And because it's the square of the degree that we care about, that means the average of the square is a diverging number. And that has produces some very weird behaviors and that's in these networks. Dominant by the larger number. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it, it can produce very strange and counterintuitive behaviors in some of these networks because they really are dominated by those few nodes that are right out in the tail. So let me just give you one sort of practical example of this. This is data from uh, the original SARS, SARS-1, the original coronavirus outbreak that they had in 2002, 2003, which did not become a global pandemic, luckily, although there were concerns about that at the time. Um, this is data for the outbreak that they had in Singapore. Uh, what it shows is uh, over here on the left, this is the first case that they know about, case number one. And unfortunately, case number one was uh, a hub. They call them super spreaders in the epidemiological literature, but same difference. They're a hub, and they gave the infection to lots of other people. Now, most of those other people are just average Joe. They're nobody special. They're not hubs. And so they wouldn't pass it on to anyone else, or maybe just one other person. But basically, the disease would have died out at that point if it weren't for the fact that one of the people that number one gave it to was number six here, who's another hub, gave it another big boost, passed it on to lots of people. Most of those people didn't give it to anybody, uh, except for number 35 here, who was another hub, gave it another big boost, and so forth. So you can see that these hubs are basically single-handedly responsible for keeping the infection alive. If it weren't for them, it would just die out, which immediately suggests some possible schemes for controlling the spread of disease. If one could identify the hubs and, for instance, vaccinate them, then that would stop disease dead in its tracks, and you'd have to spend very little effort on it. You might only be vaccinating 1% of the population, but if it's the right 1%, then it can be extremely effective. All right, so there's two examples of sort of classic results in this field. Um, what I want to turn to now is talk about what physics can contribute to this, what physicists are doing in this field. Um, uh, and uh, the answer is there's lots of things. There's 
been many contributions by physicists in this field, in particular within statistical physics. The tools of statistical physics turn out to be very well suited to problems in this area. Um, but you know, in order to make things practical, I'm going to concentrate on one particular thing. Um, uh, so uh, what I want to talk about is uh, one particular set of techniques um, that have been developed for calculating things to do with these networks. And these techniques, which are called message passing techniques, um, are aimed at calculating properties of individual nodes in a network. Yeah, question. Well, yeah, absolutely. Like Milgram's study was for the <coughs> was for the social network of who knows whom, and it's. Uh, so but that's still, in a way, an, you know, a biological network. Like, is there like a? Okay, so this is a broader definition of biology, but fair enough. <laughs> okay. I guess I mean it's like you know like. Um, well, so it's it's true on the internet, for example, and in fact, if it weren't true on the internet, then the internet wouldn't work at all. There are billions of nodes on the internet, but the number of hops between you and anybody else is typically 10 or 20. Maybe I'm saying this too. Uh, but that's still a social network of nodes, right? So I'm curious if, like, for example, like, if you, I haven't seen like, an example of a small uh, network like that in quantum physics, right? You can match against certain quantum systems and you apply different statistics and apply graphs. But in those cases, you don't always see, to my very limited knowledge, small world kind of networks. Are you curious if like, you also see these in like, cases where all the actors are Well, I mean, I would say the computers on the internet are not sentient, but uh, uh, fair enough. So in the particular case that you're talking about of quantum networks, I'm afraid I don't know mm. the answer. Um, but I would say there are plenty of examples of you know, technological networks and you know, networks of connections of machines and roads and you know, plenty of non-biological, non-sentient things that show this kind of behavior. Oh, he means the small world network. This, this small world effect was yeah. this idea that it's only a short number of hops oh, okay. from anybody to anybody else. That's the Milgram thing. Yeah. Um, OK, so, so I'm going to talk about these uh, message passing techniques for calculating things on networks. And initially, what we focus on is calculating properties of individual nodes in these networks. Many of the things we're interested in are things about individual nodes, like what is the degree of this node? Like how many connections does it have? What is the most important node in the network? How much traffic is passing through this node? Uh, does this node get infected with a disease? What happens if I remove this node from a ne network? These are all questions about individual nodes. And so this large class of questions can be tackled ably using a set of techniques that originally come from condensed matter physics, originally pioneered, in fact, by Hans Bethe and Rudy Piles. Uh, in the 1930s or 40s, but very much developed from si since then. And in fact, there have been some important developments just in the last couple of years. Question here. Um, the, the thought experiment about why the, the small world effect would happen, where you start with someone and exponentially grows. Yeah. If you create a network using a technique like a, like a completely artificial one, would it exhibit the property of those like hubs that are so much, have such a higher degree than others, or like? Uh, it seems like if you built that naturally, it would be a pretty flat distribution. Of um, so it depends how you create it, but we have ways of doing exactly that. So a large class of the model networks we study is so-called random graph models, where you specify certain properties that you want the network to have, but otherwise make it random. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I say, I want these certain properties, and then they draw a graph at random from the set of all graphs that have those properties. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it turns out that you can absolutely do that if you want to make it have those hubs. It wouldn't necessarily naturally have them. Oh, yeah, I, I was just wondering, like, in the parameter space of generating the, the, the network, is it just like, are you extremely likely to end up with those Yeah, hubs no, you, you are not. You oh, are extremely okay. unlikely to so end these, up with those. So these networks have some unusual. So they have some unusual properties, yeah. And there's a whole, actually, branch of research in this field that deals with how do these networks come to have these surprising properties. Um, so-called preferential attachment models and stuff like that, um, which I'm happy to talk about later if you like. Um, that's, that's a whole huge subfield that people have done a lot of work on. Yeah. 
why are these networks the way they are? I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take, if this is a different part, a different subfield, is suppose you tell me what the structure of the network is, now can I calculate things about it, about the way I expect it to behave, and so forth. But yeah, those are definitely interesting and important questions. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to introduce this set of techniques by a set of examples. I'll start off with very simple stuff to get us going, and then we'll work up to more complicated things. And the first example I'm going to take is calculating the component structure of a network. So here's what I mean by that. Most of the networks we look at have this kind of structure. There's one big clump of connected nodes, which we call the giant component. And there are a bunch of little clumps. So on the internet, for example, most people are connected together on the internet because it wouldn't work if they weren't. The whole point of the internet is to be connected together. But there are some people who are not connected to the internet, and they're the little clumps around the edge. <coughs> so it turns out that basically every network we look at has this kind of structure, and there are good reasons for believing that it would. There are good mathematical reasons for expecting it. This is what you call the node, is just one node. Uh, so a, a node is a single uh, black dot in this picture. Uh, this is a one hub network. Uh, so no, so the, I'm not really talking about the hubs here. These are individual nodes. Some of them might be hubs. They might have a lot of connections. But I'm now talking about sort of the larger structure. Are they connected together in a big connected clump, which is what we call the component? And it's, it's important to know where these components are because, for instance, you might want to know, am I connected to the giant component of the internet? Because if I'm not, the internet is going to be totally useless to me. I'm not going to be able to communicate with other people. So this question of am I in the giant component is an important one. Well, if you have the entire network, there are simple computer algorithms that will just kind of surf the whole network for you and find the components and tell you the answer to that question quite quickly. So if we wanted to actually answer that question, we can do it using one of these standard algorithms. But I want to do it a different way. I'm going to do it in a sort of more semi-analytic way using a different approach. Admittedly, this is a simple example, but it illustrates the point. Here's what I'm going to do. Number the nodes from 1 to n in any order you like, and then define a probability u sub i, which is the probability that node i does not belong to this giant component. It's kind of a weird probability because every node either does or doesn't belong. So it's either 0 or 1. So it's not really a probability. But bear with me here. We'll get on to more complicated things in a moment. Ui is the probability that i does not belong to the giant component. Well, the probability that i does not, be I does not belong to the giant component if none of its neighbors belong to the giant component. If any of its neighbors that it's connected to belong to the giant component, then it does too. It's connected to the giant component via them. So all of my neighbors have to be not connected. So the probability that I'm not connected is just the product of the probabilities that my neighbors are not connected. Just multiply them together. So that's what it is. It's a product over the neighborhood of i. Okay. So this now gives me one equation for every node. I've got n equations in n unknowns. I just solve them simultaneously, and I get the answer to my problem. So this seems very simple, but it's wrong. It's wrong for two reasons. One of them may be sort of obvious, the other one more subtle. The obvious one is that I'm assuming that these probabilities here are independent. When I multiply them together, I assume they're independent probabilities, and they're probably not. They're probably actually correlated. In fact, it turns out that the network has to have a very special property. It has to be what we call locally tree-like in order for them to be independent. And people just usually assume that it is. But in practice, you look at real-world networks, and it's not true. They're not independent. For the moment, I'm going to go with everybody else and just say, let's just assume they're independent. In a moment, I will tell you how we're going to fix that. But for the moment, let's assume that it's true. Even if it was true, however, there's another problem here, which is illustrated by this picture here. Suppose I'm interested in this node with the ring around it here, the one I've circled. And I want to know, is it connected to the giant component? Well, in this case, it definitely is. Here's the giant component oops, over on the left, and it's definitely connected to it. But now, look at these other nodes here at the left end of the diagram. They're also connected to the giant component, but they're only connected via me. Their path to the giant component goes through me. So that means, yes, technically they are on the giant component, but they cannot possibly be my connection to the giant component, because the only reason they're connected is because of me in the first place. So actually, it's not right to just look at all your neighbors and say, are they in the giant component? You actually only want to look at the ones that are not connected via you. Well, there's an easy way to do that. I can just remove myself entirely from the picture. If I just take my node out of the network, then that immediately disconnects these folks over here 
that were only connected to VME, but anybody who's not connected to VME is still connected to the giant body. So what we actually want to do is calculate the probability when I'm removed from the network. So it's a slightly different equation. What I do is define a new probability, which we call a message, which is a silly name. It's not really a message. It's just a probability that says the probability that node i is not in the giant component when node j, its neighbor, is removed. That's the actual probability I want to calculate. So here's node j. Probability that i is not in the giant component when j is removed. So these probabilities now satisfy a similar but not quite the same equation. What's changed is that the product now is over the neighborhood of i, but excluding the node j that has been removed. A small difference, but one that is crucial if you want to get answers that are actually correct. And now, yeah. Are, are the arrows directions significant? Oh, well, yeah. They're, they're the, the direction that the message is being passed in. When, when you read the literature on this, people are talking about these message passing methods. They say I is passing a message to J, telling J what the probability of being connected to the giant component is. So the, all of the language in the literature is about these messages being sent over the network. But you don't really need to know that. You can just think of it as being a probability. Um, so, so now I have this set of equations. And these ones are actually right. And now if I just solve this large set of simultaneous equations, I get all these probabilities. How are we going to solve them? Well, there's various ways you could solve them. But the way that people do it in practice is just simple iteration. I'm just going to guess a bunch of random starting values for these probabilities, feed them in on the right, get new values out on the left, feed them those back in on the right, and just keep on cranking the handle until the thing converges to a fixed point, which will be a solution to my equations. Well, if you do it in this particular case, no surprise, the u's all converge to either 0 or 1, exactly like we thought they would do. They can only be either 0 or 1. I did it here for a small network and then colored in the nodes, depending on whether they got zeros or 1s. And you can see it's very nicely picked out the giant component of the network in the middle and the small components around the edge. So this is a very effective way of doing this calculation. Yeah? I'm kind of confused by why it's just converging back to what you say, because obviously every node 1 is also a u, u value space. Right. Every node means zero. Uh, every, so that's true. That's a really good question. And I'm going to come to that in just a moment. So maybe hang on a moment. And so that ter turns out that that's really the crux of the matter. W which solution you converge to turns out to be a really important thing for understanding what's going on here. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, so let's do a more complicated example now. So it's only a little bit more complicated. But this, this, this will make it interesting. I'm going to talk about percolation now, which is like a standard model for statistical physics. Percolation is where you take a network or any lattice or anything like that, and you fill in some of the bonds, some of the edges on that lattice. Here, just represented by these bold edges. Just do it at random. Just randomly, with some probability p, occupy each edge. If p is very small, you just get a few occupied edges scattered around the network. But if it's large, you get so many that they gel together into a spanning cluster that goes across the whole network. And there's a threshold at which this, first, this gelation first happens, which people call the percolation threshold. This model is used, for instance, as a simple model of the spread of disease. Imagine the edges that are occupied representing the people that you actually had contact with this week. You know, you actually saw this person, and so you could have spread disease to them. Then the clusters in this network represent potential clusters of disease. If the disease starts somewhere in a cluster, it will spread to everyone it can reach along the filled in edges and not to the other people. Um, OK, so we can solve this percolation model using this message passing method as well. And it's really just a small step from what we already did. Um, we redefine this probability u i j to be now the probability that j, no j here, is not connected to this giant cluster. So, so there's, we call it a giant cluster when everything sort of gels together and make this big connected thing. We want to know what's the probability that I'm in this giant cluster. We define u i j to be the probability that j is not connected to the giant cluster via one of its neighbors i. And this now is a real probability, because this is a random process. So you did it a million times, randomly filling in the edges in different ways. And sometimes it would be connected, and sometimes it would not. So this probability is a true probability that lies anywhere between 0 and 1. 
Well, the probability of not being connected to the giant cluster, that can happen in two different ways. Uh, I could not be connected to the giant cluster via my neighbor because the edge between us is not occupied. I didn't see this person this week, so there was no probability of getting a disease from them or whatever. Um, that happens with probability 1 minus p. So p again is the probability of occupying these edges at random. 1 minus p is the probability of not occupying them. So that's 1 minus p. The other possibility is that the edge between us is occupied, but the node at the other end of the edge is itself not connected to the giant cluster. And that happens, so node i is not connected to the giant cluster. That happens if it's not connected via any of its other edges out here to the right, which is just given by this product over messages exactly as before. So I now have this equation, my message passing equation, that I'm going to solve for these probabilities. And again, I can do that just iteratively. Guess random numbers, plug them in, iterate until it converges to a fixed point, and I get the probability that each node is or is not in this giant percolating cluster. So I did that here, for example, with just a small network, and then I colored in the nodes depending on the probabilities. And you see, in this case, you know, it's quite nice what happens. These nodes that are sort of very peripheral around the edge of the network, not very well connected, they only have a small probability of being in the giant cluster. That's the red color. Whereas nodes that are in the middle of the network, in the thick of things, have a much higher probability of being in this giant cluster. So if I were thinking about the disease analogy here, the giant cluster is an epidemic outbreak, a large outbreak of the disease. And your probability of being in that cluster is the probability that you end up catching the disease. So people around the edge of the network in the periphery have low disease risk. People in the thick of things who are going to a lot of parties have a high risk of catching the disease. OK, so th this works nicely as just a numerical scheme for solving percolation models. Here we applied it to a bunch of different networks, and it works really well. The dots in these figures are laborious numerical simulations of percolation models, and the solid curves are what this message passing method gives you. And it really works extremely well. So it's nice just as a numerical tool for doing calculations, but it's more than that. You can also use it as the starting point for uh, further analytic calculations. And this gets back to the question you asked about, about do we converge to one particular solution or other, another solution. So if you look at this equation here, uh, interesting thing to notice is that it always has a solution when you set all the u variables to 1. If I set u to 1, then I get 1 minus p plus p times 1, which is just 1. So 1 equals 1 is always a solution of this equation here. Remember that u is the probability of not being connected to the giant cluster. So if u is 1 for everybody, then nobody's connected to the giant cluster, which means there isn't a giant cluster. So you don't have percolation going on. Um, so does that mean there's never a giant cluster in this system? No, it does not mean that. Because it's not only a question about whether this solution exists, it's also a question about whether you converge to this particular solution or whether, converse, conversely, you converge to some other solution entirely. Um, so it's a question about whether this trivial solution, u equals 1, is attracting or repelling. Right? So this kind of turns this question of whether there is a giant cluster in the network into a dynamical systems question. I have this dynamical system, which obeys these iterative equations. And I know a particular fixed point at u equals 1, and I want to know whether it's stable or unstable. And I can answer that by just standard linear stability analysis, just perturb around u equals 1. I get some nice linearized form that looks like this. I can write that, if I want, in matrix form like this. Epsilon is the vector that I'm iterating of the probabilities. P is the probability that an edge is occupied. B is a matrix, a linear operator, which, in, which is a specific matrix derived from the structure of the network. It's called the Hashimoto matrix, or the non-backtracking matrix. It's defined like this. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's some matrix we can write down. And if this uh, point is attracting, then this epsilon vector will be getting smaller under this iteration. If it's repelling, it will be getting larger. In other words, I care about whether the leading eigenvalue of P times matrix B is greater than 1 or less than 1. If it's less than 1, the thing is attracting, meaning there's no giant cluster. I am below the percolation transition. If it's greater than 1, there is a giant cluster. A giant cluster has appeared, so I have gone through the percolation transition. And there is a phase transition, a threshold, exactly at 1, which is where the giant cluster first appears. 
So by thinking of this as a dynamical system and considering the dynamical properties of its fixed points, I can now turn this into an analytic, continu an analytic expression for whether there is a, a, a giant cluster in this system and where the percolation threshold lies. And technically, the critical percolation problem in PC is equal to the inverse of the leading eigenvalue of the Hashimoto matrix. This then connects this percolation problem to a large body of literature on the spectral properties of this particular matrix. And now we can say all sorts of analytic things about percolation in particular networks. And there's been a lot of work done on this. I just cited one paper down here. But there's a lot of nice work on the spectral properties of these operators. So it's a set matrix at the moment. Right. It's a given matrix. Yeah, once you have the network, then you can just write it down. It only depends on the structure of the network. Yeah, so that basically, uh, so it's indexed by edges. I goes to J is an edge or in a particular direction. And it's basically, it's one if this edge feeds into this other edge, if it goes into a node and comes back out of that node again, except that you're forbidden to backtrack along the edge that you just came in. You can't go in and go back out along the edge you came in. So that's why you've got this 1 minus delta IL that forbids you from backtracking along the edge you came in. That's why it's called the non-backtracking matrix. So it's, you know, it's a rather particular definition of matrix in the case of the network. But it just turns out to be that's the operator that we need in order to make this work. And now we want to understand the spectral properties of this thing. Um, so in the last few minutes, I, I'd like to tell you about some of the more advanced applications of this idea. <clears throat> One thing that you can use these message passing methods for is to calculate spectral properties of networks. You can use it to calculate graph spectra. In other words, the eigenvectors of the matrices that represents the structure of networks, like the adjacency matrix. But as it turns out, uh, any matrix can be thought of as the adjacency matrix or the appropriate graph. So actually, you can use this to calculate the spectra of any matrix. And this is kind of neat. It gives us a new way of uh, it gives us a new numerical approach for calculating the spectra of matrices, which in some ways is much more powerful than traditional approaches because it can scale very to very large systems. Traditional approaches like the QR algorithm uh, can only scale to moderately large systems like 10,000 by 10,000 matrices. This thing here can scale to a million by a million matrices or something like that. So it gives us a new numerical approach for calculating spectra of very large matrices, which is yeah, interesting. I, but I won't go through the details of all of this because mm, time. Um, just one example to show I can actually calculate spectra of matrices using this thing. Um, what I do want to talk about is this. Uh, so this is actually n not my work. This is work by some other people. But it's really neat, so I want to tell you about it. Um, they were, so this is work by Aurelien de Selle and collaborators in France. They were interested in so-called community structure in networks. Did you have questions? Yeah, um, you said you can calculate the spectral properties of any matrix, but then you also defined that particular matrix as something special. So what, how would you get the properties of the <coughs> matrix differ from Oh, this is a totally different thing there. Uh, so the percolation problem mapped onto the spectral properties of the Hashimoto matrix different application of message passing, you can write the calculation of the spectrum of the adjacency matrix of any network, the adjacency matrix now of any network as uh, a message passing technique. I won't go into the details, but it, it basically involves counting closed walks on graphs. And there's a way of doing that in a message passing way. And uh, that allows you to calculate the spectrum of the adjacency matrix, but actually any matrix can be considered to be the adjacency matrix of the appropriately structured network. And so it actually gives you a way of calculating the spectrum of any matrix very rapidly. Um, but th so th the problem I wanted to describe here was uh, one of finding community structure in networks, which is this kind of thing where you have clumps of nodes. Many of the networks we look at have this kind of structure. You have a clump of nodes, dense clump, another dense clump, another dense clump. And so the fundamental problem is if I give you a big network, like say a billion nodes, can you find the clumps in it? Can you find these communities? This turns out to be a very useful technique for network analysis, for taking large networks and breaking them down into manageable chunks. Um, so these folks, 
de Salle and collaborators were interested in this problem, they found a neat message passing way of doing it. They could write down message passing equations. I, I won't go into the details of the equations, but the basic idea is I look around at all my neighbors and I see that most of them are in community number one, group number one. So say, well, then I'm probably in group number one too. And everybody does this. They look at their neighbors and decide what group they're in. And then you just do that iteratively. Everybody sort of iteratively looks at what their neighbors currently say and updates their opinion. And if you do this in the right way and you do it repeatedly, it'll converge. And the output is the probability that each node belongs to each group. So you can use this to find these groups of nodes in the network. And they came up with this neat algorithm for doing it. But it's so much more than that. Because they did this thing where they used this as a jumping off point to do a further analytic analysis kind of like our percolation example, they observed that there is a trivial fixed point to this iterative algorithm. Suppose I look around at all my neighbors, and they all say, suppose there's just two communities in the network. And everybody says, oh, I'm 50-50 in group one and group two. All my neighbors say that. Well, in that case, even without telling you the equations, you can see that my only conclusion is that I'm 50-50 in group one and group two as well. There's nothing to tell between group one and group two. So I have to say the same thing as well. So that 50-50 point is trivially a fixed point of these equations. Even without seeing the equations, you know that must be the case. So if you were to converge to that fixed point, your calculation has failed. You just ended up finding that everybody's 50-50 in group one or group two. You learn nothing about who's in one group or who's in the other group. So this whole algorithm for detecting communities fails if you converge to that fixed point. Well, that would be only of mild interest if it weren't for the next step they took, which is a very clever thing. They, so this, this algorithm comes from, the way they derived it is basically by fitting networks, fitting in a statistical sense to a statistical model of a network. And what they did was they generated networks from that same statistical model and then fitted them using this process. Why is that a clever thing to do? It's clever because it is well known that if you fit data to the very model from which it was generated, the same model, that is the optimal way of finding the parameters of that network or of that data. That you can't do any better than fitting data to the actual model from the actual process that generated it. What that means in this context is that for one of those networks that was generated from this actual model, this is the best algorithm for finding the community. So what they did is they created these artificial networks using this model that had communities in, say, two communities, one here, one there. And then they asked this algorithm, can you find it? And what they, what they showed was that there are certain circumstances under which it fails. They do the linear stability analysis around that trivial fixed point and find that it's sometimes attracting. And hence, the algorithm fails to find the communities in the network. Because we know this is the best algorithm for this problem, that means that all other algorithms must also fail. There is no algorithm that is better than this one. So if this one fails, all the others must fail as well. This now becomes a really deep result. It says, I can generate a network. It has this structure in it, these communities. I know they're there because I put them there. And yet, provably, no al algorithm exists that can detect them. This is actually a very deep result now. It tells us that there are problems in this networks field that have answers. We know they have answers because we put them there, and yet they are unanswerable. No algorithm can find that answer. There are unanswerable questions. They have answers, but you can never actually find out what those answers are. This is a very neat and powerful result. Um, so. And it was derived by exactly this idea of writing down this message passing algorithm and then doing a linear stability analysis around it and showing that this failure point becomes attracting in some regime. OK, I promised that I would also mention, what do you do if this criterion for independence fails? So in the last couple of minutes, let me just mention some relatively new work that I've been doing with some of my students on this. So. All of this message passing stuff has historically required independence of these probabilities, which is a problem because in real networks, you often don't have that independence. What can we do about that? Well, so the problem is basically it arises when you have loops in networks. If I'm, this is me here, and here's two of my friends. If they are also friends with each other, then 
either both of them are in the giant component or both of them are not in the giant component because they're connected together to each other, right? So their probabilities are definitely not independent. So independence fails. In fact, it fails if I have any kind of loops in my network. So I need networks that are not loopy. What do I do if my network is act actually loopy? This has long been known to be a problem with these message passing methods. Um, but we believe that we have a solution to this now. And the solution works as, as follows. Suppose, just conjecture, that you had a network that only had loops up to a certain length, say length four, and no longer. What I do is I construct neighborhoods in my network. The neighborhood of a node is the node itself plus everything you can reach by going around a loop of length four or, or less. Um, since there are no loops of length more than four, that, that's all of the loops now. I've now counted all of the loops that my node participates in because there are no longer ones. That's, that's the neighborhood of this node. And I do that for every node. And then what we do is we write down message passing equations that work by passing messages between those neighborhoods. Instead of passing them just between nodes, they pass them between those neighborhoods. This now very nicely reestablishes my requirement of independence. Basically, what's happening is here's some neighborhood down here. It's getting messages from these two nodes outside the neighborhood. But we know that they cannot be connected by any path like this. Because if they were, then there would be a loop outside the neighborhood. But by hypothesis, there are no loops outside the neighborhood. We got all the loops when we constructed the neighborhood. That was the whole point. By construction, they're all taken care of already. So there can be no connection between this and this. And that means their probabilities must be independent. There's no connection between them. So this now restores our independence condition and allows us to write down exact message passing equations. The catch is it only really works if you know there are no loops longer than length whatever. There's some maximum, like length four in this case. And that's not true in real networks. In real networks, loops, there, there can be loops of all sizes. right? So what we do in practice is we construct the name neighborhoods just counting, say, loops of length four, and then we stop. There are some longer loops than that, but we just ignore them. We just pretend that we only have loops of length four. So this is an approximation, but it's an approximation that gets better as the loops you count get longer. If I count loops of length five, it'll be better. If I count loops of length six, it'll be better still, and so forth. So it gives me a well-ordered series of approximations that converge to the true result as the length of the loops that I count gets longer. The nice thing about it is it turns out that it converges extremely quickly. Often, we only need to consider loops of length three to get a really good result. Consider loops of length four, you get an even better result. And in many cases, we don't need to even go any further than that. So it is still approximate, but it's a much better approximation than the normal message passing methods that people use. I'll just show you some quick results. This is for doing percolation again. Look, for instance, at these orange crosses. Those are, again, numerical results from laborious numerical simulations. We believe that to be basically correct for this particular problem. That dashed line there is what you get if you just do ordinary message passing, and it's terrible. It doesn't agree very well at all. Here's what you get if you count loops of length three. Here's what you get if you count loops of length four. And you can see that it's converging rapidly to the true result. I mentioned that you can use message passing to calculate matrix spectra. And that works as well. Here's just a couple of examples. The solid lines here represent the spectra of various matrices calculated explicitly using the QR algorithm. The shading represents the message passing result. And again, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, uh, here's some results on doing the Ising model on a network. So just as an example of a probabilistic model, we stuck the Ising model in the network and solved it. And uh, this. Uh, yeah, uh, red line is the magnetization that you get from ordinary message passing. It's not very good, but this blue and this green are what you get from including loops of length three and loops of length four, and they're much better. The black line there, which you can hardly see, is the true result from numerical simulations. It's actually worse in this case because it shows finite size rounding, which, is, which you don't see in the message passing calculation. So the message passing case calculation in this case is arguably even better. All right, I've run out of time here. I should stop talking. Um, uh, I hope that I've convinced you that there is an interesting field here and that physics has some interesting things to say about it. Um, 
Before I finish, I should say a big thank you to my wonderful collaborators on this work. Um, George, Brian, Alec, and Thomas, all former graduate students in my group, now gone on to great things of their own. Raj and Lenka, both faculty collaborators. Thanks to these folks here that gave us money. Thanks to you for your attention. That's it. I'm done. That's a good question. Yeah, actually, it would be trivially parallelizable because, again, it's a local algorithm. Each node is just updating its belief on the basis of its neighbor. So it would be trivially parallelizable, but probably there's only an advantage to doing that on a sparse network. On a dense network, your neighbors are almost everybody anyway. But if you have a sparse matrix, which you do in many of these problems, then it would be trivially, par trivially parallelizable. So, so if you had a differential equation with a little flash and you know it's expanded, and because it's banded, it's sparse enough? Right. Yeah, actually, so one of those was exactly that. It was a Laplacian for a, a, a large problem that we were doing. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. You can do that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't know about that. Maybe it is, but it's certainly something special about these networks. So uh, this is something that I would like to understand better. Basically, what it's telling us is that the number of longer loops is, the density of longer loops is going away sufficiently fast in some sense. So it's not that there aren't any long loops. And in fact, there are more long loops than there are short ones. The number grows very rapidly with length, but apparently it's not growing sufficiently fast to throw a wrench in the works. Um, and we don't currently understand exactly what that scaling has to be in order for this to work. But uh, there are some examples where it works poorly. And one example of that is <coughs> low dimensional lattices. Like